how do you define participatory democracy and how does it fit into a viable system? Um, it's a complicated. It's a complicated question. Um, I I mentioned early that the model looks hierarchic because it's stretched over a flat piece of paper. You can't get away from that. It is not hierarchic. You, if you think of it on a cylinder, it's it, it's a help, but you can't demonstrate it like that. I think that participative uh, management is of the essence of, of the way we are going to implement things in the future and there are all sorts of reasons for that. One is the cry for freedom but there are other things. For instance, the automation of middle management is an accomplished fact. I don't know if you've heard the word plateauing. It's, it's being used a lot in the United States now. It, it means that everybody has the same rank even if you don't decide to be a participative democracy because all the ranks we used to have, the deputy and the assistant deputy and the deputy assistant deputy and all this has been eliminated by so much automation that you have a boss and all these people and the boss tries to behave prima, primus inter pares and then you've got it. Well, I see a lot of that happening in the model in that loop between three and four. How do you get the company to run and to determine its own future? So if you think of that kind of management happening on the three, four homeostatic loop, then you're, you've got a way into this question. Remember that you've got a three, four loop at every level of recursion so that the participation between recursions becomes the connection. I think this is worth putting up again because it's very clear on that this diagram is very complicated. It takes years to uh, it takes years to understand in full, I guess. Thank you. So I'm talking about the three four loop there and of course there you see, and of course there, and that's only two levels of recursion. Now look at this line. System four connected to system four, next lower recursion, system four. So the combined effect of those in, in this dimension, in, uh, in another dimension, the, com the combined effect of all that is, a, is how I would define participatory democracy. Um, and I, I am so uh, uh, seized with the importance of this question that I have spent a lot of the last year trying to develop a theory about how to do that, um, which is based on uh, the geometry of an icosahedron. And it uses Buckminster Fuller's geomet uh, geodesic uh, geometry, which a lot of you will know. You know the geodesic dome as the cohesive force in this system. So you've got a 20-sided uh, system in which all the vertices are identical. So it's almost a hologram if you look at it as a, as a, uh, as a management system. Every part reflects the whole. And that's quite fun. And I've, I've, uh, I've got models of this and I've been running experiments with it. So please accept that I think this question is very important indeed. The viable system sounds great when everyone agrees on purpose. The obvious problem is lack of agreement on purpose, a very common situation in Latin American systems. Oh, don't boast, it's not just Latin America. <laughs> yes, well, you're absolutely right. And if, if, this, uh, if this way of looking at things helps people, I think, to, to, to see that purpose determines the autonomy of the system, then there's a big chance that they will more easily come to agreement. And it, I've certainly made that work in various, various uh, contexts. Um, 
Yes, I, I don't think I can say much more than that. You see, you can't expect any way of looking at things to undermine the fundamental nature of man. We are fairly nasty, jealous, aggressive people a lot of the time. So you will get political factions and so on. So the only way you can get commonality of purpose is to try and get everybody to see what is in the best interest of the whole. Then there may be some chance. Hmm? But never expect a system to be a, a panacea for, for, the, for human nature. <laughs> it's not going to work. How can, how can we develop a non-reductionist culture after having been reductional through almost all our history? Great question. I wish I knew. Um, I write books. I come and talk to you. We, d we do what we can. It is a terrible problem. And I would like to see an education system pioneering that. I would like universities to make much more effort than they do. Now, they, they did start. I mean, I was making fun of uh, biology and physics being separated, but we now have biophysics, and we have biochemistry, and we have a lot of twins going on. But we have to note that those things have happened because the two lines of development have converged. And therefore, people have said, oh, gosh, there's biophysics. It have not happened because of a philosophical conviction that maybe we ought to take a new holistic view of the cosmos. Now, I would like to see a learning institute devoted just to that. And why not? And it would, it would start with the cosmology and work outwards in a new way. And it would take on board Eastern thinking as well as Western thinking. I think myself that that is one of the big clues. Because the East has understood a lot of this from way back. And we have adopted a different model, which has made us far more successful in terms of um, beating nature and getting rich in various ways, but has left us philosophically, ethically, emotionally drained and that's why everybody is in such disquiet, I think. Could you give some examples of the meters you said you were going to explain later? Uh, how could they be used in management of a process industry? Have we got plenty of time? <laughs> I mean, or is everybody going to collapse it? <laughs> I don't know how much time to spend on this. this. This is the meter that I invented for the public. I told, you, I told you that I don't like polling. The reason is that it is reductionist. Now we've established our terms, I can use them. <laughs> the, 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 the poll says these are the questions. Oh, are they? They're not my questions, they're your questions. Then it says, these are the answers. Which one do you want? I say, I don't like any of them. And so it goes on. I could spend half an hour demolishing polls. I don't like them at all because they're reductionist. So I said, well, how do you know whether people are happy if they're not going to tell you that they don't like the president or they don't like this tax or whatever? Well, uh, you ask them. Are you happy? Now, again, that sounds like a naive question, but it isn't because you are happy. You know whether you are happy or not. And it's a function of a whole lot of things that are going on. Of what the government is doing, sure, but of whether you've got enough sex, whether you've had a decent meal, all sorts of things. And your brain computes a sense of eudemia, doesn't it? I mean, do you know, nobody can deny that you're more or less uncomfortable sitting here at this minute with worries or not. So I said, let's just ask them. <laughs> now, another thing I don't like about polls is all the numbers, you see, because people don't think in terms of numbers. So I don't say to the person, are you 70% happy or 71% happy? So you give them the top thing, which is the meter, 
and it has a dial with orange and blue interleaved, you see, and you just set the dial. Now, if you just felt absolutely ordinary, you could possibly have half orange and half blue, and then you say, oh, I'm more cheerful than that, and you put it up a bit. And you're not bothered with any numbers, but the guy who's doing the polling has got this on the back, and he can just read that as a number, you see. But the idea is he's not allowed to ask uh, why, why or any nasty questions with political overtones, and you just get a pure assessment of whether the population is getting more or less unhappy. It's the trend we want. We want to put that through this. Because if, if it's no change, it's no change. But if, if some slope thing's happening, then the government has to look out. So you, you say in a process industry, well, this is why I asked how much time I'd got, because uh, I can talk about this at any length you like. I want you to consider an innovation in a, in a process industry where we have a room of people working and we have a big algodonic meter up here on the wall, six, two, three meters across. Hmm? And it is our duty to set that meter every day. So we are very fed up uh, because we, we are losing money because our uh, our input, uh, what's the word? The, the raw materials we need are, are held up, we cannot work our machines, and ah, so we put this round. Now, every shop has one of these. We go for lunch, and on, in the lunch hall, there is the additive meter. It adds up all the shops. Now, what do we find? We set our meter very blue. We find that the total is very orange. How do we react to that? Well, we could say, gosh, we're just in a bad mood. Hey, Joe, run back and put our meter to the, to the average. We don't want to look uh, bad here. Or we, we might say, there they go again, blind fools, they cannot see. And we get up on the, on the table and we say, fellow workers, this meter is not telling the truth. And we try to get everybody else to change it. Hmm? So far, so good. Now, here comes the big innovation. This totalizing meter is copied in the, the president's office. Now then, we have a very interesting piece of information theory which I love to talk about it because it hasn't got any wires. It, it, it's amazing channel. It's not mysticism. <laughs> Can you see what's going to happen? For the very first time, the president knows how the workforce feels. It's never been done before, except by gossip. This is a proper measure. But the workforce knows that the president knows how they feel. And worse, the president knows that the workforce knows that he knows. And so you can go on indefinitely, and there are no wires, and you constructed a most lovely closed informational system of immense subtlety, at least so I think. And I sold that idea to Salvador Allende, and he moved the presidential office into the big tire factory outside Santiago de Chile. And we were setting this up. And then various events took place. So I can't tell you how it would work out. I've never found anybody else with the guts to try. Uh, this is a technical one. Do you consider uh, artificial intelligence could be a good solution or help to uh, implement these uh, type of systems? Thank you. Well, I have to say that, to be honest, I really dislike the term artificial intelligence. Intelligence is such an extraordinary thing that we don't understand. So if we don't understand it, how can we make an artificial intelligence, you see? I know it's your field, Carlos, forgive me. <laughs> but I'm only objecting because I feel I must about the term. Now, what people do in artificial intelligence, I very much admire. And I'm quite sure it will... It will, it will uh, it, it helps in all this because I am always looking for the smart answer rather than the bureaucratic answer. 
And, and if, we can, if we can imitate the abilities of, of people, I mean, after all, that's ability, that Im, that's artificial intelligence in quotes in a sense, because people look at, at a graph and say, I, th I think that this is going up. That does it much better. So uh, there are other human uh, propensities which can be imitated in this way. But I don't think it actually amounts to intelligence. But, you know, we're short of words. That's OK, if it's OK with you. Uh, I heard that this is the pathological evolution of the viable system. How do you cope with it? Uh, is there any alternative of bureaucracy? Bureaucracy. Oh. Oh yes, of course there is. You you <laughs> you identify what all these subsystems, how they're supposed to be. Um, is that still there? This is like a circus act here. Yeah. <laughs> Show you it often enough. <laughs> I've forgotten the question. Oh yes. Now what I didn't make very clear was this. We are generating a whole lot of horizontal variety which has got to be absorbed by vertical variety if the system is to be to meet Ashby's law, right? And I talked at some length about how not to do it on this line. Well, look at the other lines we've got. We've got this line, this line, this line, and all this interconnection here. Now, the bureaucracy grows on these two lines. Therefore, if we look at the design of the way the environments interact, which is a decentralizing process, by the way, how cities are going to behave to each other. I mean, I, I've designed enabling networks, to use that word, to put cities in touch with each other. What do you think would happen to, to all your cities in Mexico if they, if they were all on one net and each had a PC? Just that and some bright person with the keyboard. God knows what they might find out about each other and how they might start a, a green money system, for instance, with a, with a little bit of, of help. My, my friend, uh, Michael uh, Linton in, in Canada, who pioneered the green money scheme in Vancouver, makes a software package available to anyone who wants it to run such a system, for nothing. He's a, he's a real altruistic fellow. He's starving, but he's a very good chap. <laughs> now, what I'm saying is we have six vertical lines. One, two, three, four, five, six to manipulate in order to absorb total variety if we're designing this. Now, if we keep this one to its proper function of anti-oscillatory and this one to its proper function of auditing, then we cannot grow those bureaucracies any longer. It's because they become pathologically autopietic that there they sit. And I'm quite sure we can deal with it. Uh, I've never had the chance. And of course, you probably get assassinated, but it would be worth it. Developed by the Japanese, indeed. <laughs> New quality issue. 1920s was the, was the start of this in, in Britain and then in America. And we all knew how to do it. And the statistics by the, by, by the time of the war, the mathematical statistical approach was highly developed. And the Japanese come along and say, look what we've got. And I think it's just funny. And what I don't think is funny is the way they do it. I don't want to live in a society that, where, where you all stand up and sing the company song in order to make things work. I think there are much better ways. So I'm sorry to be hostile, especially as I'm sure some of you are experts in this. <laughs> but those are my own feelings, that we, we know how to do this. And the direction of participative management and of, of, of in, to use the word we had for this session, intelligent but you know what I think about that organization, <laughs> is going to be much more productive than this kind of uh, societal
coerciveness that we see in Japan. You see, you always pay an incredible price. I said earlier, we have paid a, an incredible price in human happiness and dignity and love for, for going slap out for efficiency and reductionist and all the rest of it. We, we've paid that price and the Japanese are going to pay the, pay the price too, I think. We, we need a balanced thing which will put together the whole aspect of of being creatures of the cosmos. We are children of the cosmos. We can't afford to emphasize any one of these things. And that's why I feel, to go back to where I started this morning, that if we can develop, and I've done no more than start this idea, I admit, but if we can, if we can develop a kind of unified theory of organization, which we, whereby we can see our own place in the cosmos and humanity's place in the cosmos, and the place of each other vis-a-vis -vis ourselves within the cosmos, which is all, all the philosophy and theology and religion part of my diagram, based on a new way of looking at knowledge where I think we need a, a vast effort to understand epistemology, which people don't. How do we know and what do we know with our limited bits of computer here? You know, that we were very, very short on that. We, we think we can see the world, and yet we know perfectly well that the, the visual band of the, of, the, of the light spectrum is quite narrow. The hearing band is narrow, is, is narrow worse than dogs and bats. Uh, you know, we have a very limited apparatus for looking out. And we've killed other apparatus we have because we've called it mysticism and said, ha, ha, ha. 